Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. So, September in the garden, mm. autumn's on the horizon. It's, it's beckoning, isn't it? Those, Certainly is. Those, those Summer's chi- coming to a close. close oh. yeah, and it's getting chillier in the mornings, and it's obviously mm. and getting darker so much earlier in yeah, the, the evening, which is obviously a bit depressing, but hey... There's so much to enjoy in the month of September. I think so, Chris, mm, definitely. Yeah. And yeah, like you say, nights are drawing in yeah. now. The daylight's starting to reduce, isn't mm. it? And I know from a beekeeping perspective, something I always find really interesting is that bee colonies grow, grow, grow all the way through to the summer equinox. Mm-hmm. And then once that's passed, mm. they start reducing their numbers for winter, getting ready from winter, literally from the middle of summer. Yes. And it's like, wow. They, they obviously know something we, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> that's yeah. it. So what's on this month then, mm, Chris? What we got going on? Yeah, well, we, we've obviously come to the end of the, the, the big shows. We've got at the Garden Centre, it's quite exciting, the 21st, of September, we're all about orchids. We've got our orchid day. Is Manos coming in? He is. Brilliant. Yes. Excellent. He's another one that we've interviewed, isn't he? he yeah. He's a really interesting yes. uh, gentleman. Indeed. It came from Sicily, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And yes. uh, obviously learns all about orchids and how they grow them down in sunny Italy and yes. then brought those skills mm-hmm. over to England and uh, now works for Growth Technology. Lovely, who, indeed. Yeah, they're a good company, aren't they, though? Yes, they, they produce a lot of products which we sell, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of our um, listeners will be familiar with the with the products, the compost and the fertilisers and all the other things to help our, our orchids and houseplants grow. Excellent. Well, maybe he can dance. A, this year, I thought, well, I'll cut my um, flowers back early before they totally finish mm-hmm. to try and get a second flowering stalk out of them. And I don't know whether it's the warm weather or uh-huh. what's been the issue but this year i haven't had a second flowering out of them okay so a bit of a mystery but they're all doing well and uh, i've been misting them this year which is something that historically i possibly don't do (laughs) so what we do peter we do invite our customers to bring in their ailing orchids or non-flowering orchids so you might want to bring your your, your maybe i'll bring one well i bought one into him before Mm. and um he was like well it's all right it's not that much ill and he's like then repotted it for me and it, it definitely did well, but I think orchids are such lovely flowers mm. and the, 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 the sort of different colours you can get now. I've noticed mm. there's quite a few almost yellowy ones there is coming through. Some that, nice ones, yeah. Yeah, the, so the, 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 the colours are obviously, well, as we learnt in the podcast, it's mm. all about micro, micro propagation. Mm-hmm. And I guess when you're doing it that way, if you get a bit of a weird strain, you can then propagate and propagate and propagate. Yeah, indeed, you? yeah. All those test tube plants come through to the fore, don't they? On the on the day, Peter, we'll be having some talks as well to 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. So if you want to have a sit down and listen to, to Manos, yep. basically explain that the processes of growing. And as I say, in between those talks, he'll do a, a, a an orchid MOT, which I think sounds so good. No, no it really um, is. And we'll hopefully learn a bit more about symbidiums, which mm. I seem to remember was one of his favourite topics. Indeed. And, yeah, yes. they're, 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 I mean, they are... I think I, I, I love an orchid just because I can manage to keep it growing and um, flowering each Indeed. year. <laughs> and they're so popular, as we know. They're, they're still the number one flowering houseplant in the in the UK, and long may they continue. Um, you'll see also see some orchids as well at the um, the, the RHS Malvern Autumn Show, which is on the 23rd and the, to the 25th of September over in the Malvern Hills there. So uh, a show I've not been to for, for many years, but it's yep. it's a good show. It's, it's obviously taking in the season, so there were lots of harvest and lots of fruit and vegetables on show, as well as lots of lovely shrubs and perennials to, to enjoy there. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. So that should be, should be good. if you not, not a particularly long way from the garden centre here, probably. Yeah, the Malverns aren't that far. Not, it's a lovely part of the world, isn't beautiful. it? Beautiful, yes, yeah. And just a bit of a heads up, Peter, obviously um, it starts on the 1st and 2nd of October, so it's quite quickly into the, the month of October, our Apple and Honey Show weekend. Yes, isn't that fun? I love Apple Weekend. It's, every year I'm always blown away by how many apples my mother can find for us. <laughs> I it, know. It's, it's <laughs> really, oh yeah, I, I don't know what we got to last year, but... Uh, as we learnt in the, her her interview, mm. I mean, she's a great fan of the Ashmead's kernel. Mm. It, there's just so many different ones, aren't there? There are, yes. And so many lovely flavours. I mean, Egremont Russet, 
Without mm. a doubt, it's my favourite. Indeed, but yeah. It's it's and amazing. again, not one that you see often in the supermarkets. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, certainly a real event for people who love apples. Come yeah. and have a look at all the different types that we've got. And obviously, as a garden centre and nursery, we the bare root season will be kicking mm. off we soon. Will. Within a month so, or two's time, yes. Yeah, yeah. If you want to buy an apple tree mm. i'd always suggest leave it till the autumn because mm. you can Most definitely. get them a little bit cheaper than pot grown and you get so many more different varieties don't you far more choice and we've also got uh, the wonderful jerry edwards rhs uh, fruit expert extraordinaire and plant anti- well fruit identification expert as well yeah, so you can see i mean it's yeah. amazing you just yeah. take him an apple <laughs> And know, within five minutes, he, he, he's pretty much got them all nailed, hasn't yeah, he? Yes. And he loves coming to our events, and he always says that you know we have such a good audience for him to uh, really you know show his hone his skills basically to to get that variety. And sometimes they, they are tricky; that sometimes they're not obvious, and that's why if you are bringing some samples of, of apples along, bring two or three fruits, not just one. And doesn't he like a bit of the twig, uh, sort of a bran- not mm. branch, but yeah. a, a, a little bit of the, the stem and, the stem and yeah. a, a leaf? Because obviously that, mm. I guess, same as so many plants, if it, depending where the nodes are and depending yeah. sort of what the shape of the stick or the wood and the colours of the wood, that can often give you good clues. It, it can. And yeah, one fruit on its own can give you a bit of a false sense. So, and obviously it cuts one of the apples open to have a look at the, the way the seeds form and obviously the indentations at the bottom of the fruit where the, the yes. stalk goes in. That can be a bit of a giveaway. It's a very, he's a very clever chap. Well, so, uh, I mean, I, I, until I you know, sort of spent some time with apples, you, until you really look at them, you don't realise... Yeah that they are so different. Mm. And like you say, the stalks, the mm. bases, mm. and just the, the shapes of yeah. them. And, some the, and, are, and even the coloration might look similar, yeah. but then something will completely throw you off track. So One stripey, one sort of dotted, it, but yeah, no, it, yeah. it's incredible. And I, I guess that's mm. the joy of variation in life, isn't it? it? Is. That, 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 that There are all these subtle, subtle differences, but they mm. make such different fruits. And are mm. we making any juice this year? We are, yes. The Midshire Orchard Group will be with us as well. With their, their wonderful array of varieties, obviously from a, a wonderful orchard they have over in Milton Keynes. Yep. And uh, yes, we'll be doing some, some juicing, so there'll be some juice to sample. And Excellent. And I suspect there'll be some blending of juices going as well with different yep. varieties, which is a, yeah. a nice way of getting some you know, that sharpness and that sweetness into the flavour as well. So yes, we'll have uh, Claire and her, her team, and we'll also we'll be... Um, hosting on the Sunday, which will be the, the 2nd of October, are, um, well, as we've done for a number of years, the North uh, Books Beekeepers Association. Yep, it's the honey show that mm. time of year again. I must admit, I haven't, I didn't take a spring crop this year just because I've been so busy. Mm-hmm. I haven't got round to it. Um, I need to get up to the highs to go and yeah. see if there is much honey. I mean, I should imagine there's a couple of supers that need changing. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't seen them for a couple of weeks, so mm-hmm. hopefully they've filled them all up. And yes. especially now we've got some rain, mm. I'm hoping that mm. the, uh, the flowers will be sort of coming more into yeah, producing more ne- nectar, so hopefully the bees will get even more honey uh, for the autumn so they can produce their stores for the winter. And Indeed. Yeah, I mean, it, it just fascinates me the different colours you get in honey. Mm, I mean, indeed. when you get a like, sycamore honey, which is almost black, mm, compared gosh. to something like, like an oilseed rape honey, which is a very light-coloured. One will crystallise incredibly quickly, the next one doesn't. It, yeah. It's just, yeah, the, the variations in, yeah. In, in bees is great. Right. Yeah, so over that weekend as well, Peter, which runs between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on both days. We'll also have uh, the uh, local wildlife trust will be joining as well. So there'll be plenty to, to have a go at, and we'll have a, a table of um, um, little activities for the younger garden as well. Excellent. What are we doing this year? Are we going to do paint the apple or de- no, decorate the apple? Yes, That's I think we might have a go at that this year. So whether fun, it's a, a green it? apple or a red apple, you know, bring your, your best dressed apples to to us. Or come along and, and do a little bit of creative uh, dressing up with your uh, your malice fruits. That should yeah. be good fun. That would be excellent, won't it? See, I, I love seeing what the creations the children uh, sort of come up with because they're so inspirational, aren't they? Yes. They're, they're, not, they're not bound by the... So the same constraints as some adults sometimes think they should be. Indeed, and the great virtue of, of course, with the with this event, of course, obviously, uh, 
the, the the youngsters can join our wonderful junior gardening club as well, and they can become part of the, uh, yes. the club, which is of course a good opportunity then for you know picking up maybe a free packet of seeds and uh, becoming the, the new gardener in the in the family maybe. Well, I think that's it. It's so mm. important to. I mean, I can remember growing cress as a child. And mm. It's it's fun. I mean, I think that's part of the joy of gardening, isn't it? If the, the when you actually get. For me, it's always whether you get a crop of food, mm. um, surprisingly. It is. It's worth the effort, isn't it? And, that's uh, yeah, it. And, yeah. So yeah. Pl- plenty to be to be enjoyed over our uh, 1st and 2nd of October event. All my potatoes are dug up now, Chris. I didn't get a bad crop. I was Good. quite surprised. I mean, yeah. Obviously, the summer was a bit dry, and mm-hmm. I must admit, uh, as usual, I didn't care for my potatoes very well. Um, but I did get a, good, a, a reasonable crop off them, so that's, that's I was good pleased with that. That's and good, uh... the allotments, yes, <sighs> coming to the end of the year now, isn't it? It's yeah. sort of time to clear it all out. But what tasks should we be doing now? I mean, we can do some planting, can't we? Yeah, I mean, if you get hold of some sort of plug plants, have you obviously your winter and your uh, spring cabbage, there's still time to plant those. And obviously spring uh, sprouting broccoli. Yep. Um, little gem is a lovely lettuce. I mean, you can still sow that and get that under cloches or if you've got a coal frame, okay. that would be good. Uh, chicory, if you've ever had a go at growing chicory. If not, is that an easy one to grow? It is. It's, it takes, um, yeah, it probably takes a little bit of work to get the plants to a decent size. So grow it as a little plug and then plant them out. And of course, okay. chic- chicory can be blanched, so you can you can put it under a pot and get some nice colour on it, a little bit like the uh, the endive, isn't it? Endive. Endive lettuce. lettuce. Yes. Same, okay. Same process as so that. So my well. recollection of chicory is it's always really sort of bitter. That's why you have to put it under, it needs the dark. Is that that's why, why you blanch yeah. it? Okay, so you, to get the better flavour. So that's the <laughs> <Bet, laughs> better. Is, best, is, is rather than a... edible, rather than inedible. Perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, just thinking about that, is it another one of those vegetables that is full of starch and if you can harvest it straight from the mm. garden and sort of eat it very quickly, it's actually a much better milder flavour th- or is it I think it is and also it's all to do with weather conditions and obviously sunlight and I mean there's lots of things with, with chicory you have to be quite specific for but worth investigating and you can obviously okay. grow, you can grow it from seed plenty of different varieties out there and the other one to add to the list there is Chinese cabbage which again yep. you often see the seeds that sometimes the plants are a bit tricky to get hold of so it's something you could sow pretty quickly you need to do it in the next couple of weeks of September to, to get those going um, yeah and yeah. I, I mean I, I can remember as back in the 80s when that really sort of I would say first hit the supermarkets mm. it was the new latest greatest and to this day I still love it it's, yeah. it's such a nice sort of lettuce type of lettuce it to eat isn't it, it is yeah good good flavour and again I think what we're seeing is a lot of the supermarkets are moving away from those, so that's another good reason why you should be growing your growing own. Growing your own, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is it a, So I think my mother's grown it a few times and not had great success with it. I've never tried it. Have you ever grown it? I've never grown it, no. It's been on my list to do, but okay. um, yeah, it's one... Well, maybe we should have a Chinese cabbage grow-off next year, Chris. Oh, we're we throwing <laughs> the gauntlet down? Oh, OK, right. I'll put it on my list. Excellent. OK. And as we're in September, we're, we're starting to clear our gardens. Um, yep. The best time ever to start up a compost. If there ever was a month, this okay. is the month. Um, yep. but, uh, obviously, again, referring back to our previous podcast, obviously, we had a really good chat, didn't we, with Rod Weston? Yes. And it was, yeah, no, that was a really interesting. Uh, I mean, I'd not really come across the idea of being able to compost what our class as meats and mm. sort of proper all the food scraps and I, mm. I, I looked into it a bit after our podcast and yeah, it, yeah. if you can create a sealed mm. sort of box which Chamber. is <laughs> vermin proof then yeah. I yeah. guess it, it, you're creating a whole different type of compost yeah. I, and yeah really interesting yeah so again yeah get one of those set up and obviously there's lots of options again might be worth having a listen back to the podcast because I think uh, Rod touched on um, wood wood plastic all the different types of product out there to to to, to yeah, start well, off with and some expensive some not so expensive yeah, so was it bokashi composters as mm. well which again never heard of interesting concept so yeah there's literally you you pop on to your into your kitchen don't you and it's yes a, they're inter- a, internal composters yeah <laughs> which is which is even better so even if you are restricted for space you've got a very small garden 
there's no excuse why you can't produce your own wonderful compost. Compost. Yeah, relatively easily and and inexpensively. And I suppose as we're we're into that time of the year, um, certain plants might need a bit of... um, well, a bit of reduction, shall we say, of congestion. I'm talking about perennials here. Lots right. Of, lots of perennials, certainly in my garden, are looking a bit worse for wear now. And it's a good opportunity to get the uh, the, the, the spades or the forks out to do a bit of division. So as okay. the plants start to die back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, September is good, I think, especially this year, because obviously a lot of plants have been so stressed with the heat of, of July and August. Um, you can do that quite well and you can safely divide them. And obviously that will reinvigorate the clump and uh, obviously get the plants off to a good start for next year you'll probably get a bit more flower and obviously you get some more plants for free which mm. I always like the idea of that no without a doubt As, uh, last year i saved my begonias out of my hanging baskets mm-hmm. and i replanted them and good. they actually grew this Fantastic. year chris they've done, they've done really well I, I used one of the kindergarten pop-in planters mm-hmm. uh, sort of type hanging baskets and yep. i put the begonias around the edge and That's good. I, I was really pleased so can i do that again this year or how how many years can you get out of a begonia? Many, many, actually. A bit like cyclamen, because they do produce a tuber. So yep. they, they have got a storage organ. So, so providing you can keep the that plant, you know, frost so just free, let it dry yeah, out dry and out, yeah. I'll pop them back in again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's strange you mentioned that, because some of my begonias in a, a fairly shallow pot, which I had on one of my uh, garden furniture tables, um, I just literally threw that into my greenhouse, didn't cover it, didn't really water it through the winter. That's in full flower. Um, I didn't think that would have survived. I didn't really treat it very well, but it's come back. So Brilliant. Well, Chris, I'm going to one-up you here. Yeah. you. My hanging baskets from last year just got dumped around the edge of the side of the house. Right. And left with the compost and everything in them, overwintered, yeah. and yet when I replanted them this year, that's mm. where I got the begonias from. There you go. So there you go. Upcycling, they, they, yes. Yeah, they, 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 they got frosted, they got, mm. and they still survived. <laughs> So and that just shows you don't need yeah. to put them in a greenhouse, no, Chris. Yeah, just greenhouse, just yes. leave them on the side of the yeah, house. Yeah. That'd be fine. <laughs> Good old global warming, eh? Don't we? Mm, yes. Yeah. yeah. Scarily. Yes. And um, as we're talking about, yeah, things possibly going wrong. Obviously, pests and diseases. To think about those at the moment, especially if you've got a greenhouse. If you know you are gardening undercover. Obviously, lots of mildews and botrytis. That's that. Nasty yeah, yeah. Because the courgettes this year, mm. I know at the garden centre mm. here, I went on holiday and they were all looking fantastic. Yeah. Came back and yeah. They were being ripped up, so I guess they that got botrytis, did they? And... A little bit of botrytis, but mildew mainly. And, of course, mildew on on all the cubits of family, so your cucumbers, your melons, and your marrows, courgettes, that straight away, when you get that sort of covering of grey over the leaves, suddenly basically stops photosynthesis, and the plants they basically stop, pro- pro- stop producing flowers, yep. so no fruit. So it can happen literally within a few days. Well, no, uh, mm. I was really surprised because I was hoping to pickle some of the courgettes this mm. year as um, Solvita, our plant area manager, had mm. suggested they were really nice to try and, um, yeah, yeah, missed out. So missed next out. year I'll yeah. have to try and get some tiny little courgettes for pickling. Yeah. And, and uh, Yeah, and of course I suppose that the thing is, uh, it is a shame, but of course there's nothing we can spray as gardeners for mildew now. There's yep. nothing there. So you've just got to grow them as, as best but, you can. But that's the weather, isn't it? I mean, it it's is. It's just been really hot and they get yeah. stressed and yeah a good example really they, yeah. yeah go downhill but yeah never mind indeed. yeah indeed so uh yeah so yeah as we've obviously started to get some rain now we might get more issues with botrytis which of course is gray mold tends to affect a lot of your fruits especially if you like tomatoes so um yeah try and you know pick your fruits regularly make sure there's plenty of air circulation around your plants as well that's the key and of course watering Again, try and water in the morning to avoid botrytis rather than watering in the evening if the plants are all wet in the in the, in the evening time. Yeah, the, the cold night, of the evening. That's not that, good. It, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't improve them, it does it? So that's it, yeah. As we learned from Jekka, we'll yeah. water in the morning. Feeding feed Friday. It, feed on Friday. Okay, indeed, yes, it's all there. And um, certainly I've been cutting quite a lot of cut flowers for the garden and, of course, we can still do that with our wonderful dahlias and... Uh, yep. A lot of our perennials as well, our echinops and uh, all the other other plants which are producing that second or third flush of flower. So yeah, enjoy enjoy. You know, do you keep your, uh, your your plants, you know, your cut flowers regularly trimmed to yep. encourage some more more flowers to form and keep them obviously well watered and give them that extra bit of feed. Uh, to help them along the way as well. So, uh, yeah. That's good, yeah, because I saw mm. some teasels um, that I was like, oh, I wonder mm. if the 
obviously they're, they're a plant that does sort of tend to die off a little bit in mm. this time of year and um, they were looking really brown but mm. hopefully lots of seed set so the goldfinches can go and love it yes they feed they're, off they're, them they're and, as well yep and as we're talking about sort of cut flowers as well um we're, we're into the the spring uh, bulb season now and they yes just, bulbs are just landing aren't they they are yes yeah. so your tulips so the advice of course is for your early spring flowering bulbs so your crocus your iris uh, your snowdrops and your, your narcissi your daffodils try and get those in as soon as you can from september onwards um, right just hold back on the tulips wait until october november for getting those in and a view of the fact that the soil is still going to be quite um well shall we say concrete like with even yes. with the rate we're getting then obviously it might be better to, to just hold back for a week or two as we get into september for for, for planting your bulbs yeah. okay excellent and any favorite bulbs that you grew this year chris that mm. you're gonna try and replant or are they yeah uh tulips i love my tulips i'm i'm, I'm, I'm savvy at buying them towards the end of the season where i can get more for my money yep. <laughs> so why not uh, indeed um one bulb i have grown which isn't really spring flowering i bought some caladium bulbs which is okay. a, which is a house plant which we was stocking yeah. at the moment at the garden center never grown them before they're very exotic uh, and they were put into sort of uh, one litre pots. They sat there for nearly two months, didn't do a thing. Right. And then suddenly, in the last probably last month or so, they started to grow, and they're in, they're in full foliage now, and they are just amazing. So they've okay. got they've got these sort of ghost like white with green veins on the leaf, and you get pink ones and sort of uh, green and pink uh, colorations in the veining. Yeah. So. Again, it's a house plant from a bulb, um, and I've never grown them, so that's something I'm going to be growing again. Very exotic, and mm. and they're obviously enjoyed the warmth. I started them off so, in my greenhouse, and now they're outside, and they're growing, and they're enjoying the, the warmth of uh, of August and September. So, as so long as you can grow them in a pot and like mm. say sort of you know, yes. and keep them frost free in the winter, they should do indeed, well. and they should be able to keep them for for next year. That's the hope, anyway. Are they a biannual then? Do they haven't flowered this year, or they're gr- you, or are they just grown for foliage? Just for foliage. I think they do produce a flower. Um, perhaps when they're not happy or about to to drop, <laughs> about to pop the clogs. I don't know. I'll have them flowering very quickly then. <laughs> <laughs> but for foliage, honestly, it's such a lovely, lovely plant. And um, yeah, it'd be interesting Excellent. to see how long they will continue before. I suspect the light levels will, and the temperature starts to hit them, and they start to regress. They are an American plant, so they are very yeah. tropical. Okay. Yeah, it's an okay. interesting one. Look out for them then. Mm-hmm. And finally, I suppose on the on the jobs, um, lavender. Um, lavender is yes. an important plant in our in our gardens for for fragrance to keep the the bees occupied with, especially. Yeah. Um, but now is the time really to decide to, to give them a bit of a trim back. Okay. You, know, you might want to harvest those uh, those dried flowers for for the house. You might want to create yep. little lavender bags or whatever you might recycle, or you might want to use them for other 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 reasons um but certainly yeah give the give the plants a bit of a tidy before the winter excellent thanks for that and typical to my gardening style chris i still mm. haven't got around to pruning my cherries oh peter am i too late well if you listen well if our listeners are listening to the podcast when it it drops to uh, you know the early part of the month then yeah i'd say you got up to the, about the middle of september at the very latest okay so i need at yeah. least a, is it three days a dry forecast yes. after when I'm, I might get around to doing it. Yeah, you need it. to have a look at the weather forecast and, and predict. Hopefully, there's going to be some another dry spell ahead. We can actually do some trimming back, but you, okay. it needs to be nice and dry, and give the plant one last feed once you've you've done that as well. Either a, a nice okay. generous mulch around it, yeah, or if it's in a pot, perhaps a bit of bit of tomato food or something just to give it a little bit of a boost. Give it a boost. Yeah, okay, yeah. I might yeah, I but, might get around. To- pruning my cherries this year then yes. but what is the what would the normal gardener be pruning in yes. september so i mean there's two things really roses and wisteria um okay. so yep. wisteria is, is always a tricky one you need to be just reducing you've, you've probably already reduced those big whippy groves back in um, in sort of june july if you've done that then you just trim them back to three or four leaves right. further down and that then stimulates or should have the plant in a position where it's going to start to send out some uh, uh, flower buds for, for next year. So it's just yep. just basically homing in and, and giving the plant one last little trip back. With your roses, if they've finished completely flowering now, you've had all your, your second or maybe your third flush, then cut whatever the height they are. This is, I'm talking about 
um, shrub roses, hybrid teas, floribundas, and maybe climbers yep. by, by half. So whatever height they are, take them by half. Obviously, ramblers you leave uh, to grow ad infinitum because that's what they want to do. But generally, just the reason we're doing this uh, at this time of year is to stop wind rock and the the, the, okay. the autumn gales causing lots of problems, which of course historically we have had issues in in september and october so and that will obviously encourage the plants to produce some nice new shoots further down which might mean next year you get even more flowers excellent and perennials i guess it's that time of year we should start thinking about what to cut back what Mm. to leave yeah i mean for some some varieties it's sometimes a good idea just to hold back because often they're, they're carrying sometimes useful seed pods which obviously are being collected by Birds the birds and things, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, certainly my, my hostas might need a bit of a trim back just to get rid of some of the, the slightly aged, crinkled leaves of summer. Yep. That would be useful too. Uh, but yeah, generally, if anything's starting to look a bit yellow, uh, just to trim back. We we always talk, Peter, haven't we? we have talked about doing the Chelsea chop and the yes. Hampton cut. I mean, at this time, if, if the weather is kind, if you've got some plants coming to the end of their flower, it might be worth just give that, you know, remove some of those flowering stems and just give the plant another last a bit good of feed, feed yeah. yeah and just see if you can i'm thinking there obviously of, of michaelmas daisies and uh echiums and all that sort of variety which give you that lovely late show of color obviously some are coming into their own now obviously uh, yeah. crocosmia are looking fantastic so you want to leave those well alone which is I, I, yeah i do like crocosmia i mean mm. they're, they're another one of those plants that seem to grow and grow and get bigger and you just leave oh, them yeah. and yeah and, the and, they, and they move just... around the garden as well you, you yes, start with yes. one club and they come <laughs> becoming better and i suppose that moves us on then to overwintering plants i mean we've got to start thinking as we're in september about what happens next to our more tender plants so uh, if you've got yeah if you've got a greenhouse or a coal frame or you've got one of these uh, plastic roll-up greenhouses start yep. clearing the space there get them all ready for 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 next month and into November when we need to start things, bringing things in and obviously a good uh, good clean of the greenhouse. Note to myself here: uh, get it all nicely sterilised. Yeah, the get the jays fluid out again yeah. and give it a quick um, flush around. And indeed, then. and I think because we've been I've been damping down so much, I've got I've got more green algae. I think forming this year than ever before because the humidity's been so high. So yep. so make sure, of course, if in the case of a greenhouse. That can be a bit of a slip hazard, and that's I suppose goes for for your own patios and decks as well. Make sure. It's a yeah. good point. I might ask, my, remind my mother to get her patios mm. clean because she's got lovely York paving, mm. which grows algae fantastically. Yeah. And we've got that product, Patio Magic, which is mm. a really easy product to use. Just dilute it down. Yeah sprinkle it on and kills all the algae and hopefully makes it a little less slippy in the winter because those stone paths can be such a trip hazard or treacherous slip hazard can't yeah. they and yeah most definitely yeah that's it but yeah i suppose even your paving stones in your um greenhouse are gonna possibly benefit but i Certainly. guess whenever you put a algae side like that down be a little bit careful with the runoff because you don't want to <laughs> Yeah, if you've got a, if you've got a bed, the, yeah, or, <laughs> the yeah. plant beds. Yeah, if you've got a bed or board uh, adjoining where your greenhouse is, or you've got a, a, a proper bed for your tomatoes. Mine's all paved, um, so I haven't got that issue. But it, it is a good, good point, Peter. That uh, you do need to be careful with these these chemicals. At the end of the day, they are they can be a bit tricky. Read the instructions, okay. obviously, before using. Yeah, that's it. And um, top five oh. sellers. What are we selling well? Or what yeah. were we selling well last month? Yeah, well, we, we, uh, we've, we've done the perennials of, uh, of, of uh, basically the month of August into September. And it's been really encouraging, actually. So at, uh, in joint fifth position, we've got Lupin, Gallery Blue and uh, Dianthus Tickle Pink. Okay. And at four, Rebecca Goldstrom. Yep. Uh, number three, Penstemon Pensham Laura. Beautiful, beautiful Penstemon there. Okay. Uh, two, and it's so good to see it, number two, Verbena Boninaris, which yep. of course is that wonderful see-through tall plant. And in the w- number one position, we've got a Coreopsis early sunrise. And uh, four out of those five are definitely plants for bees and uh, for plants for pollinators. So it's it's good that we're ending 
this part of the year with some really positive uh, plants for, for including for the, wildlife. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. the pollinators will love them. And yeah. like you say, sort of, hopefully the bees can get some nectar out of them and build mm. up for the winter stores. And all of those will carry on flowering well into the autumn now. So if you've got any of those varieties in your garden, or if you haven't, stock up because they are good doers for, for, for September and even into, into October for colour. Brilliant. Excellent. Thanks for that. What's in the news at the moment then, Chris? Well, it's quite a bit actually, Peter. Um, one thing which caught my eye, and I was very fortunate last month to, to visit RHS Wisley. Uh, okay. One of those days days off. Um, yep. And I spotted this. Uh, basically, they, the RHS are creating a new area, a new garden called Clear Lake. Right. And there's massive uh, amount of uh, soil excavation, lots of JCB diggers yep. taking out this huge lake, which is going to basically give the uh, the RHS Wisley Garden plenty of water. Yep. Um, and the, I mean, they quote a, it's going to, uh, it says they hold an equivalent of 42,000 domestic water butts full of of water, which is... Wow. That's that, I mean, that's yeah. going to be at least, what, half a million litres of yeah. water. So yeah. that's a good good reservoir i mean we've obviously got a reservoir here mm. in the garden which at the garden center that unfortunately again this year has dried out just yep. beca- i mean that's 25 meters by um 20 meters from memory mm-hmm. um and yeah, about 10 meters deep and i mean that holds a phenomenal well, amount of water so, yeah. but it's with this year yeah. It's dried out, so I think we need a bigger one. Mm. Maybe we should talk to them about <laughs> sort of w- w- whether they actually you know, have got enough water in yeah. theirs. But you yeah. look at all the reservoirs mm. around the counties, mm. and they're really low, aren't they? And very, the aquifers very. have run out, yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah oh. I, I think moving forwards as a nation, we need to mm. seriously be considering conserving water more, yes, or build it, or building water conservation into our house builds. Maybe put yep. big water tanks to take all that surface runoff from our, our properties because obviously yeah. it's such a, a wasted amount especially if people are putting lots of driveways in where that water is not being absorbed yeah. into the soil yes and of course our poor trees are suffering have, have, have suffered and that's an, a good indictment isn't it of the fact how dry it's been yeah yeah because we we're talking earlier right? on my way into work mm-hmm. i'd noticed a few what are classes of medium-sized trees that have just gone totally brown mm-hmm. and i thought they'd died but you, you you're not yeah, I mean, I think quite so negative, are you, Chris? No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put a bit of a bit of positivity on this. I think a lot of trees, if they're well established, and that's the thing, if they've been yeah, yeah. in there for a number of years, go into a form of self-preservation mode. They basically right. shut down. They defoliate, or the leaves perhaps go brown or go yellow. They defoliate. Effectively, the plant shuts down. And, okay. And in a way, it just brings on the autumn that little bit earlier. Right. And fingers crossed, I mean, if we do get a bit of moisture, obviously, which we are doing historically through these next few months, that yep. should be sufficient to just re, reset them. reset the plant for, for next year. Brilliant. That's good. Because, yeah, I mean, certainly looking at the hedgerows at the moment, you've got lots of brown leaves in there. Yeah. Like you say, so hopefully they'll all spring back to leaf next spring. Yeah. And um, we won't have lost hundreds of no. trees. I mean, my, my concern, yes, is obviously people who, who, you know, like myself, I've planted quite a lot of shrubs and things in my garden. Keeping those obviously well watered this year has been a challenge. Yep. Let's just let's just hope that we do get some good autumn rain and winter rain now just to top our, uh, our soil levels up and things can then recover. Yeah, and I saw Chatsworth made the news. Um, mm. The drought there on the... I don't know what you call it, the main lawn in front yeah. of the house. Parterre, um, I think it's Parterre, yes, that, that's probably yeah. the proper yeah. name. Um, it, it, I mean, the, the drought, obviously, the grass dies at different mm. rates, and it's revealed the old, I suppose, scrolling flower beds and yes. old gravel pathways that yeah. were once there. I think it was back in the 1700s. Yeah, it's, it's, well, a long the time design, ago. It, from the, the design has been revealed from, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting, and they've grown in a new garden as they well, have. haven't they? Yes, yeah, so this is quite exciting. It's um, from Tom Stewart Smith's planting, so he's a well-known uh, garden designer, and basically they've basically re- reformulated and re-imagined uh, their rock garden, mm, right. which of course is very drought <laughs> tolerant. Yeah, talking about yeah, resistant. Um, the stats are interesting: uh, fifty thousand new plants spanning t- uh, twenty different signature species. And okay, it's, and it's got a very naturalistic feel. So again, it's the typical Tom Stewart Smith signature sort of garden, 
which sounds really good. And of course, Chatsworth obviously is up in a lovely part of the world in the northwest. So, yeah, I've not been to it. Have you ever been there? I've been lucky, yes. I a, when I was on holiday there a few years ago, we looked around the house and the gardens. Very, yep. very, yeah, it's all capability brown landscaping. Okay. Um, so, this is a new one. So, it will be interesting to see. Um, and of course, of course, famously, um, Chatsworth was designed by Joseph Paxton, and this is one of his. One of his legacies was one of his rock gardens, so they've just basically re oh, right. rejigged it for the for the new century now, which is which is great. But uh, yeah, it, it sounds a great. Must be worth a look then. Go and, next spring, yeah, go yes. and have a look at that yeah. next spring. And another beautiful park, I suppose you call it, um, mm. Prior Park down in Wiltshire. They've um, reopened their Palladian Bridge, mm. which. Looks incredibly similar to one very local to us here, isn't it? I yeah. think it is. Yes, it's well, uh, it's one. Of, I think the Stowe Landscape Gardens, which is literally you know, five five minutes down the road from from Buckingham here. Well, we can see Cobham's Temple from the garden centre. I seem to remember. Indeed, and, yeah, uh, yeah, looking yeah, at the trees are uh, perhaps yeah. defoliated. <laughs> that, that, that's it. And, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think the capability Brown's landscape design is. I mean, it's incredibly mm. grand and very ostentatious i mean i suppose you could say very lovely if you like those sort of huge great parks and mm. another one that um has hit the news as well is um blenheim palace i see yes, yes. They're, they're moving into no dig vegetables so basically their historic vegetable garden is gone completely organic um obviously they've, they've been looking at developing that and of course all their produce supply their uh, their food outlets and their shop Yep. Uh, Blenheim, Planet, uh, Blenheim Palace Estate, which is great. Um, so this is, yeah, this is just another example where, um, yeah, developing the, the organic forte, the no dig, no method is so in at the moment and obviously saves on so much uh, work and, of course, keeps the soil nice and moist as well because you're not regularly open and exposing it to, to the elements too. So all in all, it's great news. Yeah, because I've heard about this no dig method a few mm. times. It's anything that calls itself no dig instantly appeals. Instantly appeals to me, Chris. So, what, what is, exactly is it? As the name suggests, you you improve the soil, so you work your soil on your allotment with lots of organic matter, lots of right. content. You generally do no dig beds quite narrow, so you can access them from both sides. Yeah. So you put pathways in. If you think about the bed being sort of a representative size of a raised bed, yeah, it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be raised. And basically, you just don't really walk on it. You don't cause the compaction, which means that we have to dig the soil. It's the it's the constant tramping right. over your uh, over your area, which causes compaction, which of course then, well, by by its nature, means that you can't work the soil as well. So by keeping off the soil and by adding mulches to the soil. In the in the in the, um, the winter, but winter levels of um, organic matter that obviously then feeds the soil. It means that you've got a much more a more adventurous way of growing, and of course it's it's more environmentally friendly. You're not exposing the soil, um, so it's it's obviously trapping carbon dioxide. It's all doing all the things which obviously global warming is encourages us not to do in yeah. a more more safe way. And it's been picked up by a lot of gardeners. Um, obviously, the late and great Jeff Hamilton. Yeah, uh, God as well. He he sort of introduced that method many many years ago, and of course a lot of people follow that system now in their gardens. Especially, obviously, people like the National Trust would use that method too, because of course it's, it's more environmentally yeah. friendly and low maintenance. I like the sound mm. of this. So, what about in the spring when all my weeds are growing? Does that mean I'm not going to have to hoe the weeds? Or oh, you still have I... to cultivate the soil, but it just oh. means the top. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but again, you would just use a, a hoe. You would you'd obviously you'd keep off that. You wouldn't actually be firming the soil. So, right. in many respects, that's that's good because obviously you, you know you've got that movement of soil, and obviously the organic matter is in there. Yep. So yes, your weeds are going to grow profusely but then unfortunately because you've got a narrow bed you'll be able to easily hand weed or run the hoe the dutch hoe over them to, okay. to kill the weeds i might have to look into this a bit more sounds mm. interesting and i see the national trust have now got a new style of greenhouse i mean yes amazing architectural greenhouse and i'm guessing it's a pretty complicated structure mm. as well. I mean, it reminded me of the Shard, I think, to be honest with you. It is, yeah. And I think it's got lots of hydraulics. I was reading the, the description, so it's got so it moves a lot. So, okay. So it sort of folds in. 
Just, if you imagine, a, I suppose, a flower yes. that opens its petals up and, mm. I mean, this is a greenhouse, so it yeah. shuts its petals down again. Yeah, indeed, well. yes, yeah, the best form of ventilation because you're getting natural light straight in there. It was, um, it was designed by a chap called Thomas Heatherwick, who also produced the 2012 Olympic torch. Okay. So there's obviously a lot of design in there. But, yeah, basically the mechanism opens so it ventilates the plants. They've got yep. a nice collection of um, unusual trees. I've just spotted there umbrella trees, magnolias, and bananas, some of the tender ones. So this is at uh, the the uh, wool being um, the wool bedding charity, which works in association with the National Trust, and uh, they're based over in uh, Midhurst. That's where Sussex, Which, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So well yeah, worth so, looking out for. Um, yeah, if in that part of the world, it's a very interesting sort of day out. Mm. Has anything else caught your eyes, Chris? Yeah, so we've got um, yeah. F- first, yeah, the, the the popular TV doctor Amir Khan has become he's a he's a massive hedgehog fan. Apparently, okay. he loves his hedgehogs, and he's become the ambassador for the um, the British Hedgehog Society, which is which is good news. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, mean, I do love he's, hedgehogs. He's, oh, very nice. And of course, that's our chosen charity is Tigger Winkles, and yep. obviously they uh, they're based over in. Uh, in Aylesbury there. Um, other thing I did spot as well, Peter, and there's uh, obviously a product which we've got in the shop now. I think it's rather clever, the, the, the clip the gloves. The clip gloves, so you yes. don't lose your gloves. And to be honest with you, I've had them now since I first got introduced to them last year. And I've still got a pair hanging on the shed, and I've That's used good. them many times. Yeah. They're decent decent yeah. quality. I, yeah, I quite nice like them. Nice designs, isn't it? Nice yeah. colours, and obviously... Yeah, a bit uh, for, brighter and... yeah. Bit more, bit more lively than the standard sort of and, town and country ones. And as the name suggests, isn't it? It's just just a clip. Basically, keeps the gloves. Yes, yeah, essentially a yeah. carabiner that goes yeah. onto the two little hoops on the top of the gloves, so it keeps them together. You can mm. obviously stick them on your belt if you're not yeah. needing to wear your gloves, and it saves you losing mm. the gloves. Which, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think they're really nice, and that, I think yeah, the, the colours on them are good for for both. Uh, for, for gents and for ladies. As Definitely. We've been there, yeah. And, of course, in the, the world of gardening, for, as far as the, the gardening trade, we've obviously got a grand opening at, uh, at Rosebourne uh, over at uh, uh, Way, Wayhill uh, for yes. an extension of their garden centre. Yeah, they've got three... Rosebourne's now three mm. garden centres. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the new... Um, well, it's, if I remember rightly, it's some um, Beckwith Emporium's... Um, Fran- I don't know if it's a franchise or quite mm. what it is, but it's based on their mm. sort of concept of 50% food, 50% gardening. Uh, gardening and, yep. uh, yeah, uh, essentially it's a... Uh, the, the, the grand opening now, wasn't it? That, yep. um, they David opened... No, David Domley opened the site... That's right, yeah, the, an extension. Year and they've, yeah. they've now re, re, revamped it and mm. um, got a... Which was good, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's obviously David's obviously well known for his uh, appearances on um, obviously Love Your Garden with Alan Titchmarsh, and of course he's a well, a good, well respected horticulturist as well. So it's good, and he's obviously supporting this uh, particular garden centre chain nicely. Yep. And he very kindly gave us a couple of copies of his houseplant book I did. from. Um, the Chelsea, because he's a Chelsea gold medal winner. He did, as well, yes. He's, he? he's created some really good gardens at a lot of the RHS shows, including RHS Chelsea. Yes, so uh, so it's good. And one little thing about this story, um, uh, Peter. There's um, obviously they they try to introduce new new companies, but this did ca- ca- catch my eye. There was in attendance was a ten year old entrepreneur, ten years old, yeah, chap, a young chap by the name of Rory Fricker, and his red fox red fox Labrador Hattie Bean. Yeah. Um basically what this this young guy has done, he's got he's got the idea of create, creating these this range of, of, of clothing. I use the word clothing, basically bow ties. <laughs> bow ties and, and neckerchiefs, neckerchiefs, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, also shampoos, colognes and travel sets for oh, your, right. your, your for your pooch. Ah. And um yeah, so uh, yeah, so the the, the the with the help of his, his mother and a sewing machine, yep. he started and embarked on this this wonderful career. So uh, look out for Roy and Bean. <laughs> that's the name. It's a great name, obviously. Definitely. Name, yeah. So but that's lovely and isn't it great to showcase a, a young entrepreneur who perhaps Oh yeah, ten year olds, not yeah. many of them in the business world There's at not, the moment, no. is there? No indeed, but uh, one to look out for. Brilliant. 
and a story close to my heart, Chris, uh, one of my favourite things in the garden, and I know all of our, uh, some other of our listeners like them too, gnomes. Of course, we have to have a gnome story in Dig It, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a new gnome care home. A retirement home <laughs> for re Gnoming, get the pun here. <laughs> Gnomes, yes, I, I think it's, it's it's great, and it's uh, I mean it's all helped to, to help uh, disadvantaged youngsters as well. I mean it's got a good yeah. good heart to it, which is no, definitely. I, I think that's it, isn't it? And if, if it can bring a smile to someone's face, why not? Indeed, yes. Yeah. So yeah, the Amelia Trust Care Farm, they're based over in uh, Glamorgan. There, uh, obviously, they're celebrating their thirtieth anniversary, and they look at different, obviously, different forms of um, education in a farm setting. So yep. why not bring a few gnomes on board as well? So Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. if you're up there and you've got an old gnome that needs yeah. a new home, take her along. Perfect. And what we got coming up in a couple of weeks then, Chris? What's our next show? Right, so we, we had a really nice chat with um, Cathy Brown, who's got a, a, a nice garden, or a beautiful garden, over at Stevington, over in uh, North Bedfordshire. So we'll be chatting yeah, yeah. To, to Cathy on all things gardens and containers. Excellent. That sounds interesting, and hopefully she can give us some ideas on what to be putting in our containers and how to plant them. Very lots of timely advice. That's that's for sure. And I guess, as always, if you enjoy our show, please tell your friends about it. Our listener numbers are growing, but as always, we'd like to have more people listening to us. And if we can ask you to subscribe, that'd be even better. Fantastic. Please do. And thank you for your tips this month, Chris. And thank you, Peter. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.